you know, this panel is all really about uh, cloud native technology and, and kind of a little bit about um, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. How many people uh, here are actually aware of uh, what cloud native means or the CNCF? Got some hands, CNCF? All right, so that's that's better and you know better than expected. Sometimes people people tend to know Kubernetes a little bit more than necessarily what the CNCF is, but that's kind of you know the downside of how we've um, you know done things. So um, to kind of get started, my name is Chris Anizek. I have the fun job of uh, being COO of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and also I help run the Open Container Initiative, um, which is all about container standardization. Um, you know, to kind of get things started, um, I'd like to introduce you know, our panelists. So we have uh, Patrick, you know, Shanzan from Docker. We have Julius, um, trying to, who do you, you're, you're independent, independent, but uh, Prometheus uh, committer, Priyanka, is at Lightstep involved with our open tracing um, efforts. Tim is part of the Kubernetes uh, team and Abhishek is a GR gRPC person. So um, to kind of kick things off, I'd like to start with, uh, you know, uh, you know, Kubernetes has a very special uh, place in my heart. It was our kind of seed uh, project at the CNCF and really the kind of the first project that actually helped us kind of build and, and spurn out the, the, the foundation. So um, Tim, you were kind of been there for, you know, since the beginning. Um, can you kind of speak a little bit of what's going on in kind of Kubernetes land and, you know, 1.6 was out recently, lots of cool, uh, lots of cool stuff and kind of more importantly, um, what's what, like, What's next? What's 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 being planned in the future? Sure. So, uh, so we did just launch one six a couple weeks ago. Uh, one six, the, there's a bunch of themes uh, for this release. Uh, we focus on scalability. We hit five thousand nodes with uh, within our SLA. Um, we focused on security. We turn on our back now, uh, so we've got full uh, authentication and uh, control over who can do what to whom. Um, we've got a bunch of cool stuff like dynamic storage provisioning. Um, that uh, you know, I think the release is it's a big release. Um, it was supposed to be a stability release. Uh, not sure how we ended up with quite so many features, but um, it's a big release. So what's next? Um, I think we're at this point in the Kubernetes uh, project lifecycle where we're starting to grow up a little bit. Uh, where we're looking at big workloads, we're looking at scale, we're looking at enterprise um, requirements um, that are that are different than startup requirements, right? Stateful is different than stateless, and um, we're trying to trying to accommodate some of those requirements uh, and make the system sort of bigger, more stable. Uh, we're focusing a lot on community ecosystem. Um, process, things that, uh, you know, as you get to a certain size, you need to have in place. Uh, so these are the things that we're really going to be working on in the next couple of months. Very cool. Um, Julius, so, you know, Prometheus also holds a, a very uh, dear special place in my heart because it basically enabled us not to only have Kubernetes within the foundation, so people could not call us the Kubernetes Foundation, which was super stressful for a while. So That's the only reason you like us. Oh, no. <laughs> You're number two. It's, 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 it was good. So, um, you know, uh, can you talk a little bit, you know, about the, the history of the project, you know, you know, you know, Prometheus being, you know, based on Borgman and some of the kind of the, you know, why the project came to exist uh, at, at your time at uh, SoundCloud sure. and all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was in 2012. Um, both I and Matt Proud back then, we were both coming from Google to SoundCloud. And SoundCloud was in a somewhat unique position back then because they already had a cluster scheduler before everyone else had. Um, Docker didn't exist yet and many other things that we now take for granted didn't exist yet. Um, but yeah, SoundCloud had this dynamic cluster scheduler but they didn't have the monitoring tools to monitor things on there properly. So we could maybe if we were lucky, see that something was wrong, but not really where it was wrong or why. Uh, because, for example, Graphite didn't give us the dimensionality and the query language insight and so on that we needed to really track things in detail, especially as things are moving around on the cluster all the time and instances come up and down and go on different hosts and so on. Um, and obviously we had seen Borg at Google and we had seen Borgmon at Google and we had seen in general how it is possible to monitor such a dynamic situation successfully. Um, so yeah, we were heavily inspired by at least the way Google did it and started working on Prometheus more as a kind of hobby project over the weekends at first. Um, both Matt and I basically over the first couple of months, I thought it was a bit of a crazy idea to try and build a whole monitoring system. Um, but then we actually got somewhere um, and thought, oh, well, great, we have an alpha. 
now let's introduce it at SoundCloud and everything broke and nothing worked. <laughs> um, but then over the years, like that actually hardened it and everything got better. And at some point there was a turning point where the Prometheus server was uh, working well enough. We had a dashboard builder that was before Grafana days. And we had you know, our cluster scheduler itself instrumented in a really useful way um, that enabled use cases that were really not possible before. And then everyone kind of switched to Prometheus. And then in 2015, we made it, like, we generally announced it to everyone, and, yeah. Well, so why did you decide, you know, why did you end up joining CNCF as, well, that besides, besides listening Chris. to my lies, but. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So SoundCloud is obviously not an infrastructure company, but they were quite nice in that they just kind of let us work on Prometheus. Um, I think it was also to their benefit. They got good monitoring out of it. Um, but they were not a company like specifically interested in owning Prometheus forever. Um, and we wanted Prometheus to not be associated with a single you know, Prometheus company that controls its destiny. Um, there's pros and cons to that. Um, but yeah, we basically decided we wanted to have some kind of independent home for Prometheus, and that's why we joined. And the CNCF thematically fit really well, because obviously cloud native, like Prometheus, was built exactly for that world. Um, and yeah, so it just fit very well. Cool. Um, so in a previous life, I spent about five years uh, working um, you know, at Twitter, mostly focused on open source infrastructure. Um, you know, we had our own respective cloud native stack, a mix of technologies like Mesos and Zipkin and stuff. And to this day, like, um, you know, it, it was it was it was magical using you know a, a tracing system like Zipkin to kind of debug you know issues within your service. Like, still to this day, is is, is it's, it's a magical experience because once you start running a ton of these services, it's a huge pain in the ass to figure out what actually uh, is 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 wrong. And so. Um, you know, uh, Priyanka, uh, you know, Open Tracing, you know, is, is, you know, has moved over to the CNCF um, as a project. Can you speak a little bit about, you know, what Open Tracing is and how it kind of relates to, uh, you know, tracing in, in kind of a microservices uh, world? Yeah, absolutely. To get a gut check of the room, how many people here have heard of distributed tracing? That's great. <laughs> and how many people have worked with microservices at some point? Okay. A, a lot. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, cool. So then most of you guys have uh, some experience with the pain point of running um, services as opposed to, you know, a single monolith. And a big thing that happens is that the visibility people enjoyed when something is one big box is lost because you have suddenly all these different places where things are going and it's hard to keep track. Um, and this is felt most deeply when someone's paged at 3 a.m. and they're asked to look into a system crashing but turns out it's actually not even related to what they do. So that's kind of where distributed tracing fits in. And um, so open tracing started because uh, there were all these uh, open source solutions out there, such as Zipkin, which is the main one, and then uh, which was based on Dapper, that was Google's always on uh, distributed system uh, tracing system in production. Um, and Ben Sigelman, who created Dapper, and folks from Zipkin and other companies such as Netflix, Bloomberg, etc., came together to talk about this problem in tracing where that it's so hard to implement even though it's the only way to get uh, visibility through a system. So uh, that's the reason for the birth of open tracing. Open tracing is a standardization spec for anybody who's interested in tracing their system. Um, it's a no-op by itself, so it doesn't do anything, which is really non-glamorous. Um, <laughs> and uh, the idea is that uh, there's a spec based on which you can instrument your system, which means set up your system to pull out data on a, that follows every request through uh, across process boundaries. Um, and uh, this is valuable not just for the application developer, but also for uh, open source folks, because now they have this option to help people using their libraries and frameworks to see what's happening through those without having to sort of pick a, pick a solution or anything. They're providing instrumentation by instrumenting their frameworks with open tracing, which is nice because it increases the coverage of open tracing. And many of you will have um, OSS software in your stack that um, is instrumented already. Uh, but like the, 
the creator of the project didn't have to pick any specific vendor, which is nice. And ultimately, even folks who provide these uh, solutions around tracing or APM, that it benefits them as well because their customers suddenly can easily try on you know, tr a new technology such as tracing to help their needs. So that's open tracing in a nutshell. And uh, I think you asked about how it came to CNCF. Yeah. Um, so for us, we, uh, we're just about a, one, uh, a year old, and we joined uh, CNCF, I think, about five months back, something like that. Um, and it, um, as uh, Julius was saying, just there was a great thematic fit as well. Um, so there is like uh, the roots of open tracing from the Dapper project at Google, which is true for a lot of the projects here. <laughs> um, and, and also just like the caliber of the folks involved on the technical committee was really impressive. Um, we needed to make sure open tracing was truly vendor neutral, truly um, accessible to everybody. And CNCF was a great place where, you know, our opinions um, converged. And one of the big factors was that, was that they are open-minded about the various technologies that can be used. So that's how we joined. And by the way, in this one year of existence, we have a lot of, uh, we have companies such as Bloomberg, Lyft, Apple, uh, Joyent, et cetera, that rely on open tracing and frameworks such as Spring, uh, gRPC, a lot of the big ones that support it. And there's credit due to the foundation that we're a part of uh, as well as the project itself. All right, awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I, th I think a lot of people don't realize the benefits of having a tracing system once you move to this, this, this kind of mode. Um, I guess another kind of uh, battle story from uh, you know my, my Twitter days. We had this. Um, we, we, we were essentially a thrift shop at the time. GRPC didn't exist. We'll talk about GRPC uh, in a second. And there was like this. You know, we, we had holy wars over like uh, monorepo versus multi-repo. Google engineers tend to love their monorepo, uh, and you know, uh, I have I have to make a I have to make a Google joke here. It's just it's just the perfect time. Um, you know, so we had this holy war on this on this topic, and uh, we eventually came up with the term um, Googwin. So you know, ending any technical discussion based on saying this is how Google did it, and as is the only answer. It's good times. It's good times, but it's an, it's it's an urban dictionary now. Go look it up. Feel free to use it. Uh, but you know, at that time we were we were a thrift shop, right? and thrift was great, but definitely had some uh, disadvantages. But you know, a lot of that was kind of inspired by some of the work um, that happened at Google around Stubby and and, and some of that stuff. And eventually, um, you know. Google built out gRPC and, and kind of open source it. So, like Abhishek, I would love for you to kind of talk about like some of the, you know, origins of the project, why why it exists, um, you know, why kind of Google operates um, at uh, you know at this at this model. Sure. Um, so, Stubby and the the RPC model of distributed communications has um, has been around at Google for for a long time. Really goes all the way back to the the origin of the company itself. But um, Stubby as a project existed for almost a decade and a half now. Um, and it's used as a core building block for distributed systems. It's also uh, proven very useful um, in our multi-language stack. So, um, you know, the ability to write a server in C++ and have Python or Go clients talking to it. Um, it allowed teams to sort of make make their own decisions on how they would build their own services. And it allowed um, the overall company to scale to thousands of microservices. Um, but it, it did have its limitations. It was baked into um, you know all of the internals of this monorepo that we have. Um, and it was specialized for the fairly homogeneous environment that, that um, you know, Google's internal private cloud runs on. Um, and as public cloud started taking off, and mobile, which is the other um, big use case that we target, um, we we needed to have something that was more modern, um, that was open, that supported heterogeneous environments, um, and that's where we started gRPC. Um, so it's the same team that that has been doing Stubby. So we we brought all of the concepts and everything that we have learned over the years, um, but we um, did a brand new design. Uh, for the protocol, and then we have, you know, fully in the open implementations, um, and uh, we we wanted it to be um, something that anybody could use in 
you know, just as Google had its own RPC system that was a building block internally, we wanted other startups to be able to take it and use it without necessarily, you know, having any connection with Google or even our um, commercial products. Um, and which is why it's it's been something that we wanted to have good open licensing on and eventually when the opportunity came along to uh, have it be part of CNCF, we were delighted because, you know, the ecosystem was there um, and especially other projects that, that uh, have a nice complementary nature to what, what we are able to provide are under this umbrella now. So, um, you know, there's always this funny kind of trend of, you know, like Google open sourcing some stuff, you know, uh, doing like a, a, let's say like Greenfield implementation in Go of like an existing uh, uh, thing built. Um, how has been kind of the adoption of, uh, you know, uh, gRPC internally versus the, um, you know, kind of, you know, essentially the migration path from the, the old system, new system, how is that? Um, sure. Um, so actually, the, the one place where we really needed something was for our own cloud products. Because even though we were building those products on our private cloud, the consumers were all on the public cloud or outside of Google. And, um, and we couldn't have used Stubby in that situation. So that's the one place where gRPC is already heavily in production. Um, most big Google cloud products are, have already switched or are switching um, in, a direction, in the direction of gRPC. Things like Cloud Bigtable and Cloud Spanner are, you know, if you look under the covers, they are pure gRPC on the wire. Um, and internally, it's going to be a, a big operation to switch, you know, the engines on a flying airplane, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, but we are moving in that direction. Uh, and in fact, um, later this month, we are going to, we have, uh, a couple of hundred projects on gRPC right now, and later this month we are going to open it up to you know all all Google developers and all Google projects. So we see this as a multi-year effort to switch all of Google from Stubby to gRPC. But that's definitely the direction we are headed in. Awesome! I'm I'm excited to hear that. Um, so. You know, you know, uh, containers, container standardization is definitely like near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, people always joke. Uh, you know, you know, looking back 18 months ago when you know OCI, CNCF was starting around. You know, these these funny quote unquote container wars and and all that you know fun kind of jokes we made in the past. But recently, um, you know, CNCF has accepted um, Containerd and Rocket as its uh, eighth and ninth projects. Um, you know, Patrick, do you kind of want to speak about your experience of not only you know kind of the you know, obviously we saw Docker keynotes last couple of days and the, the continuing refactoring of bits and pieces outside of, you know, kind of the engine into these different little kits. Can you speak a little bit about, you know, that process and kind of, you know, how Container D came to, uh, you know, the CNCF? Yeah, sure. Uh, so yesterday, actually, in the keynote, Solomon told that story pretty well of uh, how we extracted different components out of the Docker code base to make them independently uh, usable. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, Chris here, I see him every few months, we go to a conference together and there we donate a new component. So the last time was at LinuxCon in October, it was InfraKit. Uh, and then uh, more recently it was ContainerD and today we announced LinuxKit and, uh, and the project Mobi to kind of assemble all that. So uh, our goal at Docker there is that, that we, uh, as Solomon said yesterday, we discovered that to go to the second stage of evolution of the ecosystem, we needed to start componentizing, uh, and that's where uh, ContainerD is coming from, where we extracted the core cont container runtime component so that the whole industry could uh, standardize on, on that, and then we donated it to CNCF uh, because it really made sense. Uh, ContainerD is using uh, gRPC. We really love it. Uh, uh, Steven, who's here, uh, should write a blog post about how much he loves <laughs> gRPC, because he's raving about it all day long uh, in the office. We sit uh, very close to each other. Give him uh, a sticker. <laughs> uh, so we use, a, we expose a Prometheus endpoint yeah. in ContainerD so that we can expose that in Docker. Uh, so pr we love the Prometheus project as well. So, so <laughs> ContainerD was using some projects from CNCF and ContainerD is, is uh, wholly designed uh, to be embedded into uh, a higher level platform like Docker. So we built it for Docker first. Uh, but then the, the most obvious second candidate would be Kubernetes. So to replace Docker as the core container runtime in Kubernetes by implementing um, uh, the, um, uh, how is it called, the interface? CRI. The, CR, uh, the CRI interface that Kubernetes created to make the container runtime pluggable. 
so it really made sense uh, for Container D to uh, uh, to be part of CNCF. No, it's definitely super cool to kind of see, you know, we don't force our projects to integrate in any way. It just kind of naturally um, happens, which is which is good to see. Uh, you know, <laughs> Tim, um, what do you, um, so Patrick mentioned CRI, right? Um, you know, uh, Kubernetes has some, you know, interesting choices in terms of like what it kind of ships as its kind of default container runtime. There's kind of a lot of discussions and efforts in terms of, um, you know, supporting Rocket. Uh, there's this Creo initiative. Can you kind of talk about, you know, how the Kubernetes team is going to, you know, in the future, uh, kind of build out CRI and what may ship as, as a default? Will, will potentially Kubernetes take container D? Um, so, right. So, uh, in the, this room, real quickly, how many people uh, have written software that they're still dealing with three or four years later? <laughs> how many of you are proud of all the decisions you've made? <laughs> we got one or two, right? So, you know, uh, Kubernetes uh, started off as a fast project to move quickly and capture a bunch of ideas, right? And what was the, the only player in town was Docker. So we built it against Docker. And uh, software grows over time, the team grows over time, uh, there's a lot of pressure to ship, move quickly, um, and so software grows organically. And so uh, this time last year, what we had in our kubelet, which is our, our agent that runs on every node, was um, like Docker scattered all over. It was just little bits of Docker all over the code base. Um, and we were starting to think about like, well, what do we do if we want to have a, something that isn't Docker? We had a lot of people who had really interesting, crazy ideas of, of cool stuff they wanted to do. What if, what if the containers were actually VMs and you could put this really hard security boundary in between? Like, how do I do that? And they started sending us patches. And the first thought I had was, oh, oh hell no. Right, like there's no way I can take all these patches into my code base and test them, qualify them, make sure that I didn't break them on every single release. It was crazy, right? And we started doing this with Rocket also. Um, and so we had to do this massive internal refactoring to put up a, a really hard wall between the kubelet proper, which has a bunch of interesting logic, and the runtime part of things. And so we, we call this uh, CRI, the Container Runtime Interface, which I guess giving it a three-letter acronym makes it a thing, but it's not a thing that most people are going to deal with. It's really Kubernetes internal abstraction uh, into the runtime. So the first version of this is the Docker implementation of, C of CRI, which took all of our Docker code that was scattered throughout the code base and it lumped it all together into a couple files and uh, put it behind this, this API, which is also a gRPC API. Um, great big love fest up here. Um, no, we, 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 <laughs> And we like we like gRPC. We you know we we we've used Stubby, and so like it just is a good fit, right? Um, so uh, so this is what CRI is. Now the cool thing about plugin APIs is as soon as you've got one, everybody wants to implement to it, right? And so we've now seen Rocket implementing against CRI. We've seen this other thing spin up called uh, Cryo CRI for OCI. Um, eh, except we had to change the name. And, uh, Sorry about that. Um, so Cryo is another implementation of OCI based uh, containers against the CRI interface. We've got the Hyper folks who are implementing uh, against uh, Hyper SH which is a, a kind of a cool hypervisor system. Um, and when Container D came uh, it seemed like a perfect fit. Like the API matches pretty much one to one. Uh, that it has all the constructs we need and none of the baggage that we don't. Um, and all, like might as well have been designed to fit, right? Uh, so it's perfect to build this, this layered system. Uh, and so we've begun work on Container D as an implementation of CRI for Kubernetes. Um, whether it will become the default or not is not for me to decide, right? Okay. Kubernetes yeah. is an open community. Yeah. Uh, and so we're going to see how the work proceeds and see what happens. All right, awesome. Thank, thanks, Tim. Uh, before I ask one more question, I want to kind of poll the audience here really quick. So uh, obviously all of us are at DockerCon, love containers. Um, uh, how many of you are actually legitly running containers in production? Raise your hand. Uh, wow. Okay, wow. that's good. That's, that's good. Uh, I'm going to say 75%. Uh, how many are uh, using uh, Kubernetes? All right. Down. How many using Mesos? Okay, down. How many using Docker Swarm? All right, perfect. Um, so, uh, you've really no. Yeah. How many are using Nomad? 
Yes, we got, got the guy. The guy. Woo! Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's obviously there's multiple ways to run, um, you know, containers uh, in production environments. Um, you know, uh, this whole notion of you know cloud native systems, cloud native or you know architectures running essentially, you know, microservices packaged in containers using some just central orchestrating is, is, is not necessarily a new concept. Some of the technologies are new, but like companies like you know Google, Twitter, Facebook have been doing this for a long uh, time. Uh, for my panelists. Uh, you know, w w why do you think this is hard for companies to essentially adopt? Like, you know, we're still at this point where, you know, a lot of people are still trying to run containers production. There's lots of choice. What's kind of your uh, opinion in terms of why this is kind of taking a while and what, what can actually be done to make this, this easier? Uh, well, feel free to go, Tim. I'll go. Uh, I mean, this is a this is a major technology change, right? This is the sort of thing that happens once every ten or twenty years, right? This is this is as big as virtualization, right? Um, and so, of course, it's not going to happen quickly. Um, you know, I, I live in this little bubble in Silicon Valley where everybody adopts the hot new thing every year, um, and it's really fun and it's kind of kind of cool to talk to these people, but like they do not represent the industry at large, right? Um, and so when we venture outside that little bubble and we talk to the banks and the, the automotive manufacturers and, you know, these guys operate on an entirely different time frame than, than I do. Um, and so, so it's not surprising at all that it takes a long time. Um, the technology is, is new. It's changing very quickly still. Um, you know, we're, we're refactoring the stack to figure out where the boundaries really are. Um, you know, it's not surprising to me that people would be a little reluctant to sort of jump into that deep end. Um, I think we're, we're getting there. I mean, you, hey, we all saw the keynote today, right? So there's some really important adoption that's happening right now, um, some enablement that's happening right now. Um, so I think we're, you know, we're at this turning point. We're at the corner. Awesome. No, yeah, it's, a, it's sometimes a little bit crazy because, you know, if, if you work at like a kind of a, a high tech company in the Bay Area, right, you don't realize sometimes like, like for example, I don't know if people are familiar with like airplanes, right? You know, the, the support cycle on like an Airbus or Boeing plane goes for like 30 years, right? Just imagine like the amount of like source control system and technology changes that happens over that time and being able to support that's just absolutely insane. Like people live in completely different, um, you know, zone than, than we do. Um, I think another factor is the tooling around these new workflows. So um, as many of you probably know, uh, the set of things that worked for a monolithic architecture don't translate to uh, suddenly when you're in services. And the operation cost of running one service is A, and then as you increase the number, it Slow, in, exponentially increases. So it's not even a linear increase. And so if you don't get your tooling right, it's very possible that everything co will collapse on itself. And people have seen some of those horror stories. Um, and uh, it takes time to figure out that tooling right to feel the comfort that a developer felt in Monolith in this new world too. Awesome, thank you, thank you Priyanka. So we have about 10 minutes left and I always kind of like to turn it over to the audience to basically ask any questions. Um, you know, Tim has kind of complained it's been about a love fest, so if people could ask some very hard, challenging questions to Tim to counter that trend, it would be greatly appreciated. Also, if you want to ask yeah. a question, I ask you to queue up here. Or raise so your hand, whatever, whatever works. Exactly. Sure, or queue up. Oh, there you go. Um, hello, guys. Um, I'm a little bit special to this uh, event because I'm from the HPC community. It's a little bit weird for me to represent the high performance compu computing uh, community and join this kind of cloud uh, system event. Uh, so uh, we have the challenge that uh, uh, for some HPC uh, code developers, they also want to use uh, something like Docker, containerize their application, and the running those applications inside of our HPC infrastructure, which was specially designed for high performance computing with a lot of features like uh, uh, GPU uh, or InfiniBand, all these kind of uh, uh, accelerators for HPC only. So. Uh, but uh, we also was constrained by the, the tools that we cannot find a, a proper tool to uh, enable containers to land on our HPC infrastructures. And we also have a lot of constraints like uh, uh, we have to rely on the HPC uh, 
tools like uh, Slurm or this kind of resource managers, and we cannot just uh, skip them and directly control uh, those res HPC resources. So my question is, uh, I'm sorry about for this long kind of explanations, but my question is how will our um, kind of uh, Docker community uh, think about uh, the, this kind of a market for the HPC users, uh, HPCs, you know, can I take this one? Yeah, so because I, I have a few ideas about that. Uh, so if you saw the keynote from Solomon yesterday, that's exactly why we created Project Mobi. Uh, we see that the, when the container ecosystem is going mainstream, we'll see more and more specialized use cases, and HPC is a very good example of that. So maybe, for example, Docker or Kubernetes don't have the right abstractions today to let you run uh, uh, in a HPC scenario by leveraging uh, the hardware to the maximum. But that's why on the Docker side, we went through that componentization movement uh, where we componentize all the components. So here, uh, and then we released Project Mobi uh, yesterday. And I think Project Mobi for a HPC scenario could be a very good option because there you can build your system with the kernel that you want, and then you just add container D on top, uh, and then maybe you can add an orchestrator that's, uh, that knows natively how to leverage HPC resources. I think that's a really interesting point. Um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people sat through the, the Mobi demonstration yesterday, sort of scratching their head, trying to figure out exactly <laughs> what, what this is for, right? Um, I mean, it's, it's cool, and it's a really neat demo, but uh, it's not obvious who's going to use it. And I think that's a, this is a really interesting application of it where people want to consume the machine, you know, capital T, capital M, um, which is very different. I think systems like Kubernetes, like Swarm, are about the abstraction of the machine. And I don't want you talking about the hardware, right? I don't want you knowing the name of the hardware because the minute you do that, you are going to cause pain for me. And, um, and I'll show you some of my battle scars from Borg. Um, and uh, we, we, we've done a lot of this stuff. So, like... I want HPC people to be successful, but y'all are crazy. Um, and the, the, the requirements that we get from HPC people are, are pretty extreme, right? Um, and so I think like uh, Mobi might be a really interesting application here, right? And uh, I apologize for not asking uh, for who are like the Slurm uh, users uh, in, in the audience when I was pointing out the orchestrators out there. So. Hey, question on uh, tracing. Um, when do you think we'll see uh, something like open tracing, although not necessarily one-to-one, -one, the specification being one-to-one, -one, for things like uh, asynchronous messaging, for things like Rabbit, Kafka, things of that nature? And also, a uh, second question, um, how do we get kind of the, that experience, that first-hand experience that companies like Google, Twitter have had uh, running microservices in production over the last decade to organizations that are just now sort of adopting that microservice uh, architecture? Great, so uh, the question was around um, async uh, messaging, like where does tracing fit in for that? Is there something similar? So the good news that I can tell you is that there are people working on things like Rabbit like right now. So. Um, these are not completely um, sort of uh, disparate things. Uh, just because a, a set of transactions are async doesn't mean that uh, they cannot be traced. The whole idea is to propagate context of what happens through a system, uh, whether it happens asynchronously or linearly or whatever. Uh, so that's the one good news. Uh, and I think the second question was more at large about um, how can other companies adopt uh, similar microservices-based structures. And just from our experience uh, going, uh, you know, down, um, being on the road with uh, customers at Lightstep, which is um, a next generation uh, APM workflow based on distributed tracing data, is that the most important thing is standardization. So um, there are many important things, to be clear. <laughs> but one of the most important things is standardization. So uh, the natural instinct, as people are bringing out into services, is that there are teams of developers who build for a specific purpose, and people use the best tool for that, and they build based on that. And that's good. However, when that, that's good when you're like 1 to 10 services. As you move from 10 to 20 to 100 to 1,000, that level of disparateness can come back to really bite you. And some level of 
standardization along um, what kind of things go into each service is really going to take you far. So it's kind of like, uh, if you've heard the analogy of going from pets to cattle. So when someone has a pet or a, one service, it's like your favorite, it has a name, it's like got its own color, it's special food, whatever. And then when you mass produce, it needs to go more along the cattle route where things are much more standardized. I personally don't love the anal analogy because, you know, factory farming, etc. But it gets the point across. Um, <laughs> so that's one thing that'll take you really far, especially because it'll prevent the big roadblocks that you see on the tooling front, because the more their standardization, the easier you can get visibility, easier you can act upon the information. You know, I think to, to add to that point, you know, one of the one of the challenges is also, you know, to, to kind of run like your, you know, Google's or Twitter's or Netflix, not all the technology out there is fully like open source or available or collected and integrated in, in a useful way. And so like one of the missions of CNCF is to kind of bring these technologies under one neutral roof and have them, you know, essentially integrated, talking to each other, working together, um, and basically provide people the choice to, you know, run, the, you know, their kind of systems, um, you know, uh, like your Googles and Facebooks and all that good stuff. I think it's interesting that uh, Google's in a place now where we're incentivized to publish more about what we're doing, right? So how can you learn about some of our experiences? Like, like come and talk to us, right? I, I have sort of carte blanche to talk about things that we've done inside Google with respect to Borg, um, and I think it's, I think it's the most fun I have all year, uh, is sitting around <laughs> talking to people about cool things that went sideways. Um, so. All right. We got we got uh, time for probably one one or two questions. Uh, one quick question: uh, Open Container Initiative. How does this <laughs> relate it to to this? Sure, I will. Uh, I'll answer that. Why not? Um, so, uh, the Open Container Initiative is a separate kind of sub foundation of the LF. Um, you know, I kind of have a saying that the the Linux Foundation is like a diversified index fund of open source foundations. So things like CNCF, you know, OCI, Let's Encrypt, Node.js Foundation, Automo Automotive Grade Linux, they're all you know, Linux you know, foundation efforts. So it's a completely separate uh, entity. OCI is very heavily focused on just the standardization aspects of the kind of container uh, runtime and the image format, uh, and is kind of a much smaller uh, project than, uh, than CNCF. Um, there's obviously some collaboration that happens between the two kind of communities, but it is a completely separate entity with its own charter and how it runs things. Let's do one more. Oh, Can I add one point? Uh, just adding one point, Container D is an implementation of the OCI specs. Yeah, it, yeah. Exactly. So. so implementation in CNCF, yes. spec in OCI. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it too. Uh, let's do one more question and then let's uh, close it out if, there, if there's any more questions. So we got one more in the back, and then this will be the last one. Hey, uh, so you talked about standardization, uh, and you've talked about the various components uh, that are part of CNCF today. Um, there's there's another com the uh, is do you also have like frameworks or kits on your mind like div like you know like the Go Kit or Finagle things like that? Are any of those, um, you know, do you have ideas on? What should be included in such a kit? Is, or? is is your question of like what what potentially else will be included in CNCF down the road, or which I guess project? there are two questions. One is, will any one of those, or any one of those, are you looking at any including any one of those? And the second is, do you have any standard f or, or thoughts on what, or, uh, like for tracing, you don't have a specific product, but you have a standard on tracing, right? Similarly, you have these kits in many languages. So there's, is there any thoughts of having a standard? for the kit or the framework. So um, to your first question, kind of like what projects may potentially come into CNCF down the road, um, we, well, to answer this, it's a bit of a complicated process in terms of how projects get accepted in CNCF. We kind of have this independent uh, technical operating committee, we call it kind of jovially call it the Technical Supreme Court, uh, and it's nine people, Solomon, Ben Heinemann, Brian Grant from the you know, Kubernetes team, they get to decide which projects kind of get in or not in the foundation, and you know, it, it's a process that, you know, sometimes projects come to us, sometimes they go reach out specifically. Um, we have this thing called the cloud native landscape. If you go to github.com slash cncf slash landscape, it's this ridiculous uh, like way too many logo diagram that kind of you know displays which projects are out there and which you know areas of like storage networking and so on which projects are in CNCF which are not which are prospective projects and so on uh, I recommend looking at that potentially get an idea um, the other question was um, I guess maybe kind of open tracing related like you know yes there's a spec kind of uh, standard within 
C and CF, but there's no like respective uh, implementation. Um, yeah, I mean, in the future, we would love to have kind of a, a tracing technology, like actual implementation within uh, C and CF uh, down the road. We've talked to the Zipkin folks. There's some other technology out there too that may come in. So um, I guess that kind of puts us out of time. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, thank you, panelists, for your time. I hope this is super useful for folks, and thank you.